uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, I am Guillermo Sabatier, your host. I am on Perspectives on Energy. And joining me today is none other than this Jay Fidel, the CEO of Think Tech Hawaii. It's always a pleasure of having him on the show. And uh, again, I, I want to express my gratitude to, for being here. So, uh, Jay, welcome to the show. And uh, this is a, um, a uh, very, very, very big milestone on, 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 on this program. It's a bittersweet. So, uh, so definitely um, glad to have you be a, be a guest on, on today's episode. Thank you, Guillermo. It's, it's great to be with you. I always enjoy our conversations. Likewise, likewise. So, so yeah, the, uh, um, uh, some of you may know, we're the, they're sort of winding down uh, at ThinkTech as far as the number of shows that they're going to be recording and broadcasting every, um, rather, rather than every other week, it's going to be as, as ad hoc or as, as something is demanding. So we're going to be, for example, I mean, I don't want to call this a farewell episode, but definitely I want to make it a summary episode and uh, kind of express to Jay my, my, my heartfelt gratitude and appreciation for everything that he's done, the organization, the team, Haley, Michael, everybody on the team that, you know, they've been amazing when it comes to facilitating, making this possible. So again, my heartfelt thank you. And on behalf of the leadership of HSI, we want, we're very, very grateful for the opportunity you gave us to be able to present um, our views and, 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 our, and our expertise on this particular topic. So thank you once again. Appreciate it. Back at you, Guillermo. Back at you. Uh, you're a, a terrific host. You cover you. substantive material. You educate people. Um, you do great interview work. Uh, it's, it's an honor and a delight to have had you in our lineup. Well, thank and you. I really appreciate you know, there's two kinds of people in the world, Guillermo. There's the follow-through people and the others. Yeah. And you are clearly in the follow-through camp, and I greatly appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. So, and, and I think in today's episode, it was, it was appropriate to, I guess, summarize, right? Like, uh, a lot of the things that we, we, we've learned, I mean, I learned so much on this show. I mean, not just my own show, my guests, and having you on it, but also watching all your other shows as well, right? I learned quite a bit. There's a few other shows there on energy and renewables, and, and, and I'm going to watch them periodically and see what I could learn and hmm, what, what their impression is. And, and Jay, it's one thing I wanted to ask, right? So the whole goal of this thing, you know, as a citizen journalist, right? You know, like, like we all are, and we bring our expertise. Uh, what, how has your impression of this energy industry, the utility industry, renewables, climate change, and how all this all plays together? How has that perspective on energy changed for you from, from then to now? You know, it's interesting that uh, we had a show earlier today Mm -hmm. about the effect of the Biden aid bill to Ukraine and finally you know, got passed by Congress and, you know, and su supplies are already headed to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. and we went through all these very complicated issues about how that war is going to change. And my last question to one of these, um, you know, PhD social psychology experts from UCLA um, was, uh, yeah, all that's very nice. But what about climate change? <laughs> and she almost fell off her chair. Mm. Because really, that's the true agenda. That's the existential threat. And energy is right there with climate change. It's really directly connected. And not only you know, climate change itself, but the economy, the right. society, the civil society, the industrial society in which we live. So this was a part of our lineup from day one, and we covered energy, you know, God, for almost 25 years mm -hmm. in one show or another. And, you know, per your question, it's changed a lot in Hawaii. My, that's my perspective. It's yeah. changed a lot. Um, we've, seen, we've seen things come and go. We've seen activists, uh, you know, dwelling on the issue of whether or not we should have clean energy and green energy. And we're past that now. Now we're into uh, what the government should do about incentivizing that sort of thing. And we had a bit of a wrinkle with the next era transaction, which mm -hmm. failed. And I always thought that should have succeeded right. because energy, and you can talk about this, energy is really a national initiative. You can't forget about it. And we can't get distracted, uh, you know, by, I'm sorry, oil and gas as, as the sole fuel 
or as the bridge fuel. We have to talk about clean energy because that takes a lot of money, time, and creativity to develop. Uh, and that's where our head has been in having all these various shows about energy. Uh, primary show has been Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could say, tell you, Guillermo, that it has made more progress uh, than it has. Now, for a long time, um, we had the Energy Policy Forum here, and I was, I was active. Aside from think tech, I was active in that forum. Uh, and we had a lot of shows that came out of the members of that forum, industrial members, government members, about 50 of them. Mm -hmm. um, and regrettably, it, it kind of went away with the change. And uh, you know, I'd be happy to discuss with you how the change affected that forum, how it affected the industry, how it affected the, what do you want to call it, the collaboration, the, the collaborate, collaborative aspects of the industry. And, and, and that's the thing that, that, that uh, touching back on the whole next era deal, really that, that's how you and I sort of, I mean, it, it started with the episode about, about the, the, the D, the re-regulation that was happening in Mexico, a sort of thing a couple of years ago. And I, I, you had an episode on that, about how governments are renationalizing their assets and all that. You had a really good episode on that. That's why I asked questions, and we ended up talking. And then we talked, and then he, then I, I, I expressed how I used to work for NextEra and involved in that project. And 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 it was a real tragedy that that didn't go through. That that would have been such a showcase for clean energy, independence, and then also and and then like low cost, low cost electricity, reliability. I mean, all these things that that that, that to me, I, I think back now, and, and it's just a shame, right? Because you would have been there. You would have really been there with low cost. I mean, a dime a kilowatt hour easily, right? And you would have had reliability of being interconnected, and it would have been all clean. And I mean, that that, that just wasn't meant to happen at that time. It's fine, but but um, and, and yeah, so it's really too bad because yeah. let me dwell on it for a moment. It was. Uh, it seemed to be a very good idea. Next era was making every effort to, mm -hmm. you know, connect up with the local political you know, actors. Um, but at, at one point, there was an energy conference. I'm sure you've been to a thousand of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where the governor, where the governor, uh, David Ige, it was a few years ago, appeared at the conference. And by surprise, he said, I don't support this deal. I don't want this deal to happen. Nobody knew that he was going to take that position. And he had not, you know, counseled with advisors on that. Right. He just decided, maybe on the basis of a very limited amount of information, um, to stop it. You know, and if you're a chief executive of a state, you have a certain bully pulpit, and people bought into that. And before you know it, uh, the Public Utilities Commission was down on it. A lot of people right. were down on it. They saw it as a bunch of um, interlopers coming coming here and trying to take advantage of the state. And that that's a cultural problem that we have. Um, and so it it died. And I totally agree with you. It would have resulted in much lower rates. Uh, some some of our rates are 40, 50 cents. You know, mm -hmm. uh, incredible. Cents a kilowatt. I was, it's 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 astonishing that that. But I mean that 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 impacts the way of the quality of life. It impacts uh, business. It impacts investments. It impacts everything, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, it's difficult. I mean, it, it even impacts safety and security when it comes to like uh, um, infrastructure and how all, all that is set up. Yeah, it's everything. It's, it's the whole community. I don't think people realize that it's the whole community and it's the whole business community. It's the, it's the economy. Um, you know, a, a, you know uh, a state, a community with good energy, cheap energy, mm -hmm. um, is, a, is a more successful community. It builds the economy. Right. And we haven't had the benefit of that. We've been struggling along with these high rates and, and reliability has been an issue. And and I'm sure you followed the fire in Maui, mm -hmm. which has put uh, Hawaiian Electric back on its heels. Nobody knows what's going to happen with them. They have all these lawsuits pending, um, you know, and, and it, to the extent that they might have had the capability to do a lot of stuff on clean right. energy. There were, recently, there was an article in the paper to the effect that they won't be able to do that because they have all these other financial issues facing them. So, um, yeah, we, we, we are not in as good a position as we were before right. uh, for a variety of reasons. On the other hand, I want to say that your show has given us a kind of window into the national 
energy industry and picture. When you talk about it, you are exposing our viewers mm -hmm. to what is going on in the field. I mean, in the field on the mainland. We, we don't get to see that locally because it's all sort of screened. But when you talk about it, you are educating people on, you know, the, the, the specific points on how you do this stuff, how you collaborate, uh, how you deliver, uh, how you set pro I mean, all that stuff. It's so right. valuable really. to hear you talk. And I, I, again, I really appreciate you coming on, educating not only the people in your community, but the people in our community all over the state. Right. And, and and that that and thank you for saying that because that that that's really it it really 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 like uh, it's 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 gratifying to 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 see that because I'll see the comments on on the show some of them disagree and and then and then we'll have an exchange and and then ultimately you know they they kind of see what what I'm discussing but like it just when it comes to islands right just and from the benefit of say geothermal and being interconnected just look at Iceland right economically how they're doing. But really, it's like they they don't have the wealth of like beauty that Hawaii does, but uh, but they benefit a lot from very 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 inexpensive energy. It's renewable, geothermal for the most part, some solar, some wind, right? And they, they got their shot of they got their share of fossil fuels, right? Because they pretty much like anywhere else, they have a diverse portfolio of sources. But the fact that they can have uh, they can drive the cost down because of the that renewable resource makes a huge difference. Hawaii has the same potential. I mean, all the islands have all that potential for geothermal. It's just not being inter interconnected really impacts the economies of scale, and they cannot really deploy that asset like you know to to, to make the best use of it. So you know, there's a there's a bill in the uh, state legislature which would allocate uh, a bunch of money for various things, mm -hmm. but I noticed that it allocated six million dollars for. Um, exploration for further geothermal, and I said to myself, six million dollars. Uh, how do you say that in in uh, in in French? I mean, it's 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 peanuts. Yeah. Um, that, that's that's not enough money to really make a difference. I'd also want to respond to your comment about Iceland. But you know, my wife and I went to Reykjavik a few years mm -hmm. ago, and we're driving around in Reykjavik, and we see in front of all these uh, apartment buildings, which are very nice design. The Scandinavian, Scandinavians really know how to do design, <laughs> and that includes Iceland. And in front of every building, there was this gray box, and uh, there's always the same kind of gray box in front of the building. And that's it. The, the driver, what's going on here? Why, why the gray box in front of every one of these residential buildings? He says, that's geothermal. That's how they heat their water. Uh -huh. And it's free. Yep. Once you hook up, it's free. And they understand that, and they use it. Now, we have geothermal, but we aren't really developing it that well. And right. there's political resistance and cultural resistance. And it's a shame. Uh, we ought to think more like Iceland. And, and, and it's, it's, it's basically harnessing. And that, like, community heating, really, it's a way for them to control the excess heat at, at, at the site. So that really becomes a byproduct, right, to heat the, the homes. And then, but, but really, their main, their main drive is actually generate electricity. So they control that excess steam by allowing that to heat the, you know, infrastructure. So it's, 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 they really make good use of it, but and hopefully it'll work. And you know what, the same way, if you, if you do heating, you can use that steam to actually do cooling, because then you can spin compressors, that sort of thing, run air conditioning, and then now you lower demand of what you're doing. So there's many different ways to harness that energy, right? Um, but yeah, ho hopefully that, that, that will make a difference. And, and, um, the other thing I remember about one of your episodes is when you had that state representative on there who went over to Oregon or Idaho to that special webinar, a two-week webinar. It's one else over there, and then he ends up over here in D.C. And I was like, yes, that is exactly what we're trying to – even if it's not us delivering training, at least he's out there getting training, and the policymakers are getting educated on making better informed decisions and then again, giving them a better perspective on energy, right, and understanding how that works, and God, that that was really gratifying to see him, to see both of you on that show and have him discuss what was in store. And uh, well, you know, you talk about trying to educate uh, legislators uh, mm -hmm. here or elsewhere, yep. and um, you know, I, I really wonder. I mean, I uh, Joe Biden would like to see more clean energy. He's kind of liberal about that. Um, but I think the other side of that coin is dealing with um, pipelines and oil and gas, yep. which can be very profitable. And there are a lot of people that, that argue for that. Um, however, however, 
I don't think that Congress right now, the way it's situated, is able to move ahead uh, on developing energy around the country. I mean, I don't know if they fully understand that better energy, cheap energy, clean energy is better for business. It's better for the economy. It's better for the country. So my question for you, <laughs> Guillermo, is, is this country moving fast enough? Is our policy following the realities? When I think of some of the things that are happening in Europe, uh, I say, gee, they're way ahead of us. Why can't we move like that? Well, they were moving ahead rather quickly. They were shutting down a lot of the coal and oil facilities until the war in the Ukraine happened. And then Russia stopped the supply of gas. And gas is the, it's the least dirty of all fossil fuels. So it's a good transitional fuel to get away from the dirtier oil and, ga oil and coal. And they eventually move away to something cleaner, right? Problem is that uh, once you did that to to Germany or, or Europe, then you know they ended up in that problem. So for them, they were they were getting really far ahead, but they were really dependent on on a very few types of resources. So they were they were vulnerable. Here, what's happening is uh, most places have done away with oil. They don't burn oil for electricity. And I remember where I, where I used to work in Florida, they were the largest importer of oil to burn on their power plants. They went from the being the largest importer to being no importation at all as a utility of oil to burn in their in their facilities. And mind you, they they swapped over to natural gas, and that helped. And then eventually they swapped over to like you know they just made more nuclear. But for the most part, they run mostly on gas, right? Which is an interesting change. Now, as a country, what I'm seeing is that uh, reliability took a serious hit because we were moving ahead pretty quickly with solar and wind, but now mostly solar. Now reliability took a hit to the point that we're we're, we're teetering uh, or, or edging closer to having reliability issues. And what does that mean? Well, meaning that you're more vulnerable to blackouts, system-wide blackouts, which now they're kind of, they're they're looking at it with a more uh, cautious approach. So so they're hanging on to some other like natural gas assets, but they're being a lot clean and a lot more efficient. They're still retiring coal. There's almost no not, no oil oil burning plants to speak of. But what I do see is that they've made several billions of dollars of investments, Department of Energy and the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and a few other labs on the small modular reactors. But that's, I think, where, where we're headed to next. And it's going to be, they're commissioning a few already, and a few more, a, a few more are coming. And I think that's going to be the, um, that, that, final, that final straw where we're going to finally move away from gas and then go towards something that has true zero emissions. Um, nuclear has its own you know, controversial issues, but at the same time, we'll finally get away from fossil fuels altogether thanks to that. And that, that they say, will be, the, will be the vehicle to do that. You know, years ago, we had a show about that, about modular, small nuclear reactors. And my recollection is one of the Japanese trading companies was actually trying to sell them. I, I want to say Toshiba, uh, but I'm not certain of that. And um, my recollection, a state senator here uh, called me down to his office and he wanted to tell me about this. And he said that Dan in Norway, remember that big, big influential senator here, was actually in favor of such a thing. Wow. Okay, and he described the, the, um, the device, if you will, as a, the size of a VW bus. Yep. And you dig a hole and you bury it maybe 30 feet down. So it's, yeah. And, and, and out comes uh, cheap, free electricity for like decades. Yeah. And, and when it's done, you can either leave it there and take it out and put another one in place. And for a certain size of community, this was the perfect solution. Yep. And given the technology now, it's not risky. You know, in Hawaii, we have a, a constitutional provision, I think, mm -hmm. that says that the legislature may not adopt nuclear energy without having some kind of special two-thirds super vote of both houses. Um, and, you know, that, that really stands as a brick wall. Uh, bottom line, though, is that this may be very important in the future, yep. given the fact that it's safe with current technology. Um, so how, how far advanced is this? Um, are installations being done now? There's a, they're commissioning a few of them throughout, throughout the country. Um, in fact, there's nuclear right now in Hawaii. There's small modular reactors all over Hawaii right now in, in, in your naval vessel, mm -hmm. whether it's a sub or a carrier. Those are nuclear reactors that are running, small modular reactors that are running already. 
And when they're when they're docked, they're they're basically running and, and generating power back to shore. So rather than taking in shore power, they have the ability to go ahead and generate power back to shore and, and be a source rather than a load. So they're already there. They're already there in the form of, of, of vessels. And I, I think that that was a discussion uh, on one of the other shows you had with that um, I think it was a state representative in Hawaii, who the, the one I mentioned earlier. I, I was, I, name Carl is Rhodes, I think. We had a show with Carl Rhodes. Uh, and uh, or maybe it was someone else. They, where they, he had state, this, state representative or a state con uh, congressman at the state level, I think it was. State level. Yeah. Um, I forget who it was, but there was a, a, re a representative who actually um, introduced not one but two bills right. calling That's for right. nuclear, you know, nuclear initiative in Hawaii. I, I'm pretty. This is this session, yep. um, but I'm yep. pretty sure that the, the, they failed because of the cultural resistance. And the cultural resistance is not only to nuclear, you know, and thinking about Fukushima and thinking about World War II and all the bombs and whatnot. It's also about new. Uh, there's a resistance in Hawaii to things that are new that haven't been tried before. And that's a problem because if you're in energy, I know this from the way you handle your shows, the way you handle your career, you're looking for new. You want new. You want to be at the cutting edge. At the Innovation. cutting edge, yes. Innovation. <laughs> so, so his name was Corey Chun. Representative Corey. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it was. Thank like Michael. He he typed it in there in the comments. <laughs> I appreciate it. So, so it, it, I mean, I think there was a loophole. It had to be, if it was bigger than a certain size, then it required a supermajority. So, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that bill's going to die somehow. But it, it's it's a shame because it it's, um, the technology is new. It's, it's, they, it's usually working with molten salt. So that is the that is a medium. So basically, if something breaks, everything just comes to like a rest, and the molten salt just just solidifies, captures that nuclear material, and then it, that's it. It's 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 a very passive system. Uh, unlike other other larger nuclear reactors, you got to have active cooling and pumps and water circulation and a whole a lot of other control systems. This basically is relying on just you know molten sodium, and it's a lot safer. And it's highly simplified, but it's a lot smaller. But but it's in places like like Hawaii, for example, that would have been ideal. The other thing that I'm thinking about as well, and and I'm not sure if you ever saw this. There's a documentary on. It's uh, it, in the Azores, right out there. They 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 have really gotten really good about becoming renewable, cost effective, and then they also harness fresh water to the point that they they built a lot of pump storage sites where they have an upper reservoir and a lower reservoir. And they're using that to capture water, and they run water back and forth. They, it, it generates power when they need it, and then it, it, it'll it become a load as pumps when they have too much power, right, with the renewables. So for them, they struck a really good balance for that. And I, I know that Hawaii has a lot of rainfall, a lot of humidity, a lot of moisture that collects, and it eventually just runs off into the ocean unless it's being captured somehow. So that, that whole pump storage opportunity is there in Hawaii. Has there been any conversations about that at all? Or well, it's funny that you should mention that because, you know, when the Energy Policy Forum that I mentioned earlier still was first started, I I was there and they had all these technologies, uh, all kinds of different technologies uh, to generate electricity. I mean, if I named them, there'd be 10 of them. And one of them was the pump storage thing, right. a big battery where, you, you know, uh, another one was compressed air, if you remember. Right, another one. You put compressed air into the ground and it acted like a battery. But all those had fallen aside. I don't know if this is so everywhere, but they've fallen aside in favor, um, not of wind, although, you know, I, I think wind is really important. Mm -hmm. In fact, offshore wind, I'd like to see that happen. Yep. A lot of people think that would obliterate the, you know, the horizon or something, and they don't want to do that. Um, but it's solar. We have focused completely on solar. Mm -hmm. And solar has, has, you know, there's a certain innovation um, aspect to solar. The cells are getting better. The, Connectors are, you know, getting better, and and so you got to give them credit for that. But that I think we ought to look at the whole portfolio, don't you? And right. and find out what we can perfect some other kind of technology, which we don't do. I want to I want to get to one thing with you, Guillermo, mm -hmm. and that is you know, thinking about um, the bridge, the bridge in in near Baltimore, the Maryland Bridge. Oh boy, uh, that was that was crushed and 
you know, it's going to take, I don't know how many billions of dollars to fix it. Um, and in the meantime, you know, that affects the channel, it affects shipping, yep. it affects the city, and for that matter, the East Coast is a problem. It's the old infrastructure thing. And I remember Spencer Abraham, Abram was the uh, Secretary of Energy years ago, and there was a blackout in the Northeast, and it came to him and said, Secretary, how could you let this happen? He says, what do you mean? You know, you guys haven't renewed the infrastructure. That's why it can't handle, you know, the blackout. You have got to renew the infrastructure, like the bridges, you know, the, the, uh, energy is an infrastructure. And um, query whether we are doing that. Query are we keeping up with infrastructure? And is there going to come a day of judgment here where, you know, utility companies and delivery, delivery of electrical energy, you know, begin to fail simply for the passage of time and deterioration? What do you think? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting, difficult question because we are having some serious problems with aging infrastructure. And there was the, the infrastructure bill passed by the Biden administration was sort of lopsided in favor of developing renewable resources and not really just expanding or reconducting or maintaining the existing infrastructure. So, so they, they had these caveats on there to, to, to expand a certain thing versus, you know, the kind of like ignoring the other existing problems. So my hope is that that they will retool that and make changes with the uh, with the actual just the, the the transmission lines alone, right? In most cases, they're 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 nearing what they call their reliability capacity, right? And that's that, that to me is a big concern because of the fact that the, the way we move power across you know different states relies on that infrastructure to work. But more important than that is you're always preparing for that next contingency, that next disaster. So usually the way you design and run the grid is to you're able to withstand one really bad scenario and you're still fine. Problem is that we're getting closer and closer to not being able to withstand that worst case scenario. And that's that's what concerns me and everybody else in my industry. Whereas like we're building all these sites that these solar sites or wind sites or renewables off away from the from the load centers, which is you know the urban suburban centers, and then we have to bring that power in. And the more you got to bring in from one place to another, the more vulnerable you are. Right? It's it's j j just imagine as as a a lot of traffic and a very congested interstate. I mean, now you're going to add more traffic to there. So really, there's you either have to expand or create more highways, mm -hmm. and that's the problem we're faced with right now. And and, and infrastructure is not just it's not just power and roads. It's a lot of different things. Uh, water uh, managing water, managing reels, resources managing highways even and all of that. And of course, and one thing that I have seen that's been great has been the broadband for all. And where they made it to the point where even the uh, the rural co-ops got into the business of actually uh, putting fiber, high-speed fiber on all of their facilities. Now everybody in the country will soon have access to high-speed internet, which is a game changer. At the same time, you know, uh, all that computing power is going to require server farms that are going to consume a lot more energy. So, you know, that, that in itself creates more load. A lot of the EVs, for example. I mean, they, look, we have a Tesla. It's, it's like running another, like, big expensive dryer for two or three hours to charge that car, right? So imagine if everybody else is running a Tesla. At some point, right, you got to be able to like, space that out, and that on its own is going to have an impact on infrastructure. So, so uh, there's changes being made. There's concerns about that, and, and so we're seeing where it, it's it's headed in a good direction, I think. But it requires considerable amount of attention and investment as well. And of course, I remember, I remember the Puerto Rico affair mm. not too many years ago, uh, where the power went out. Yep. And um, yep. we had somebody on the show who talked about the the solar farms there, which were important in the in the Puerto Rico system. Um, and there was one solar farm uh, in Puerto Rico that had a certain kind of fastener, fastening down the cells on the stands, and another kind that had a different kind of fastener, fastening the cells down on the stands. And when the wind came, it blew one of them right off. All the cells were scattered everywhere. It was non-funk. The other one stayed, stayed together. And so it raises two questions. I mean, the, the materials you use, the design, the cost of all this infrastructure uh, has a big, you know, a big effect on it. It's oh, resilience. Yeah. The other thing is that while we speak, 
climate change is getting worse. So happening. Yeah. While we speak, more extreme weather is coming. And maybe the same storm, you know, uh, will, will be 10 times worse and blow all of the cells off Puerto Rico. <laughs> and by the way, Puerto Rico had not yet fully re uh, recovered from that no, anyway. Not, is not. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm thinking is that um, whatever we do in infrastructure, all kinds of infrastructure, is we have to make it more resilient to keep up with climate change. You know? mm -hmm. And, and not just that, it, it's, it's the, the other idea is like all of these solar sites, they are all usually built by independent power producers. So they're all using a different contractor, a different standard, a different like benchmark, and which is why you see these some of them more resilient than others. And at the end of the day, right, it, it is a business. You, you're running a business in that case. So and so that so if, if it's a utility that owns it, they tend to have a certain uniform standard across all of them. But when you have all, all these IPPs, which is independent power producers, now you have different things that you're dealing with, and, and that, that becomes a problem. My concern as well is, remember, energy reliability is also a national security issue. Mm. And that's something that everybody tends to forget, right? It, it's, 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 uh, it's important, right? Because, hey, we all admit that climate change is happening, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we keep the lights on. And that's that that balance, and 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 then the the third leg of the stool is make it affordable. So so it's it's got to be clean, it's got to be reliable, it's got to be affordable. So those are different things that that um, we all struggle to balance. But I think with this show and 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 everything that we've done, I mean, we definitely made a difference in helping everybody get this perspective at least. Um, and I definitely appreciate the opportunity to have done this. So. Uh, Thank you, Guillermo. It's, it's, I remember when we first met. Mm -hmm. We haven't met in person, but I remember when we first met on Zoom, and I was so impressed because you are hmm, a corporate expert. That's what you are. <laughs> um, in, you know, in terms of the training, the technology, and the corporate relationships. You know, in Hawaii, we, we don't have that. We we have something else. We have local style, but it is it's not something that looks over to the next state. You do that. You see things on a national picture, and I, and I think that's so valuable. And I have so appreciated your, it's in the title, your perspective. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, I definitely appreciate the opportunity. And, 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 and whenever you want to have another show on something, that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always available, always happy to participate. If I see something that's pressing and really interesting, I'll de definitely like, rope you in and see if we can have a, a a cool additional episode on there that that because uh, there's quite a few things that are changing and, and uh, quite a few um, innovations that are about to become commercial pretty soon. So I'm really eager to share that with the rest of the world, definitely with Think Tech, you know, and your audience. So uh, always looking forward to that as well. Yeah, let's both plan to follow up. Outstanding. Thank you, Guillermo. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, have a great trip in a few weeks, by the way. So yeah. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess this uh, look, we're a few minutes over, but uh, thank you again for the time, the opportunity, and uh, it's always a pleasure. And uh, have a great one. Talk to you soon. Much more Jay. to come. Take care. Aloha. Bye bye. to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.